I'm probably going to catch flack for this, but that's okay because I'm on the right podcast for it, right? Oh, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Um, I would say that much of the ableism that we encounter in the world is the fault of the church. Because if the church learned to center not disability as the only thing, but if we were a part of the conversation when theologies were being developed and formed, and we were not reduced to just metaphor, I think that the world would, would encounter folks with disabilities in a very different way. Okay. Okay. One, two, ready, go. Welcome to the Called to be Bad podcast. My name is Mariah Martin, and I feel called to be bad. It turns out I'm not the only one. Join us as we dig into all things bad, scandalous, deviant, you know, the stuff that makes good church folks squirm in the sanctuary. Why? Well, because sometimes the scandalous is spiritual, deviant is divine, and bad is beautiful. Say yes to the call and let's see what holy trouble we get into today. Hello, JJ. How's it going? Good. Welcome to Call to Be Bad. So this is the Reverend Dr. JJ Flagg. His pronouns are he, him, his. And uh, JJ has committed his life and his work to seeing the church to be a place of welcome to and for all. Uh, he's an ordained minister of the United Church of Christ, and he is the newly called Associate Minister of Pastoral Care and Justice at Myers Park Baptist Church in Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, having been born with a disability, advocating for those with disabilities is an integral part of living out his call. And uh, one of Reverend JJ's greatest joys is being a partner in life to Ebony and a father to two very energetic daughters. Right. So we also have two fur babies that are Ooh. part of that uh, mix, too. We have a, a puggle uh, whose name is Oatmeal and a <laughs> she Shibador whose name is Oreo. So. Shibador. So yeah, is that the Shibi... Inu, Shiba or, Inu and a, Shiba and a Inu Labrador. And a lab yeah. Oh my goodness. Is that is that loud? Is that a loud dog? She screams very <laughs> loudly. Yes. I have a few TikToks saved of screaming huskies and just screaming dogs in general. I will watch those until I cry. I don't know why I find that so funny, but they do. They scream like a human. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so JJ, I have you on here today um, to, we're going to talk about disability theology. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but before we dive into that topic, I'm curious what you are drinking today. So my, I would say that my drink is rather uneventful. Uh, it's just a standard sweet tea. Um, yeah. Sweet tea. Very sweet tea. So maybe it's Very not uneventful. Uh, Cause it has lots of sugar. I like sugar. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and so I have uh, my good old coffee today. Um, and I have it in this mug that I got at the depot, which is like our local thrift store. It's amazing. Okay. And so all their mugs are 25 cents. So if hey. all of you are like judging me for how many mugs I have, they're 25 cents at the depot. Okay. <laughs> Um, and it's, it's just like simple, but it's like the perfect size for coffee. So I don't, cause I do an AeroPress, so I don't add too much water to it to dilute it. And it has like a cute little, the handle is like perfect for your thumb. That is a really nice handle. Isn't that nice? So that's my coffee today. Hello, beloved baddies. A quick break to tell you that this episode is sponsored by the Center for Art, Humor, and Soul a nonprofit that supports and amplifies the voices of edgewalkers through art that catalyzes change, laughter that brings us together, and soul awakening to the creative spark within us. The support from the Center for Art, Humor, and Soul has meant the world to this podcast, so I highly encourage you to check out their website, arthumorandsoul.com, to see their other featured artists and projects. If you want to support the podcast, you can check out our Patreon or get in touch. Now I'll let you get back to this episode of Called to be Bad. So how would you define disability theology? Yeah, I, I'm really happy that you asked me how is it that I would define it. Because, yeah. Uh, one of the things that I love to tell folks in this conversation is that when you listen to one person with a disability talk about 
disability and disability theology. You have listened to one person with a disability yes. uh, mm -hmm. talk about it. Um, and so I by no means am a voice of authority for all people with disabilities. But the way that I would define disability is simply, or maybe not so simply, um, someone who lives with a physical or mental difference that places them at the margins of society. The way that I would define theology, simply put, would be God talk, mm -hmm. or the way that we talk about um, that which is higher than ourselves. Yeah. So I, I'm curious about your own story and how you have become passionate about disability theology. Do you have any stories yeah. or examples or? So my my story I, I love this question um I, so i grew up in a a a spiritual family not necessarily deeply religious um happened to grow up across the street from a church mm -hmm. uh um so i heard the sounds of church long before i knew what the inside inside of a church was like um mm -hmm. and something about hearing those sounds made me curious I wanted to know what was going on in inside of, of those walls and and was very interested uh, and finally got a chance to visit the church that was across the street from where we lived. And um, something about that experience just hooked me. Uh, mm -hmm. Nobody else in my family regularly went to church. Um, it, it Something stuck in me from that one visit that I was like, I want to be a part of this for the rest of my life. Hmm. Um, so um, that church ended up being the church that kind of shaped and formed my faith for many years. Um, and somewhere along the way, that was probably, I was maybe stayed in that church until started going there at six years old, left at maybe 16 hmm. um, and started attending another church um, in the city of Miami. And, uh, the theology was very different, very different. Um, it was the first time that I had to, uh, wrestle with what it meant to be a person living with a disability. Hmm. Um, because the theological framework within the church was one that, um, I, 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 I don't want to say that it was a word of faith church, but it, it kind of had word of faith like esque teachings and theology. What does that mean? I know so, I'm not familiar with um, folks who followed the name it claim it movement, like uh um if 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 you see a car that you you know that you want and you want God to give it to you, you name it and you claim it as yours okay. and God's gonna make it so So kind of prosperity gospel. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Um, but I, but um, they actually got that that nomenclature as a as an insult. But their their it was it was for all intents and purposes it was known as the word faith movement before people start labeling it the 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 prosperity gospel. Okay. Movement. Um, so okay. I I ended up. Uh, I don't even remember how this happened. I think I was getting ready to finish high school and I was really interested in studying scripture. I wanted to go to school to be a pastor. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up in this place that was billed as a Bible college at the time. Um, mm -hmm. uh, it was one of those uh, church-based schools, um, uh, not really accredited or anything. Like <laughs> that. But uh, I remember being in, 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 in one of the classes and the professor got up and said, um, JJ is in a wheelchair because JJ doesn't have enough faith. No. Um, or JJ, um, if, if it's not that JJ doesn't have enough faith, then, you know, God is uh, holding JJ responsible for something that his parents did. Or um, or maybe, maybe that's not the case. Maybe it's because he has hidden sin in his life. And, uh, and, and, and I, you know, I'm sitting there kind of like, God, what the, um, I think it was the first time I had a WTF moment, like in yeah. a church setting, uh, like what is happening? 
Um, yeah. So I remember wrestling with God about that and, and just being like, this absolutely sucks. Um, so I went home and I made up in my mind uh, that, uh, that I was um, going to prove everyone in this class wrong, mm-hmm. that I had enough faith. I was going to, I, you know, for those listening to me, um, I, I totally skipped the fact that I'm, I was born with cerebral palsy. And so mm-hmm. because of that, I, I'm a wheelchair user. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I'm sitting in this class in my wheelchair and, you know, become this object lesson for the night. But I leave there and I make up in my mind, I'm going to go uh, and get on this walker and I'm going to prove to them that I have enough <laughs> Um well, go to the doctor, try to get approval for that to happen. And the doctor says, um, I tell him, you know, I'm, I'm here because I want to be able to walk within about a year or two or whatever. And he, with no, with no sugar coating, no anything, says, well, that ship has sailed. Like, you can, mm. you can forget it. It's not, <laughs> it's not, not happening. Um, um, and for the first time ever in my life, I had to really come face to face with the fact that I may never walk again. Mm. Um, And so I remember being angry with God on the way home from that doctor's appointment. And I went home, I sat in my room and uh, I, I remember saying to God, God, if you are going to be the type of God that would hold me responsible for something that I didn't have a choice in, um, I don't want anything to do with you. And so I got ready. The only tangible representation of God that I had at the time was my Bible. Got ready to pick my Bible up and throw it across the room. And my Bible opened to John chapter 9. And it may sound weird to some folks, but that was the first time that I had ever read that text. And it was the first time that I saw myself in the text. So John 9 tells the story of Jesus and the disciples on their on this journey and and they come upon this man on the side of the road who was born blind and the disciples Mm -hmm. asked the question, Jesus, uh, why was this man born blind? Was it because of him or his parents? Uh, um, And Jesus says, none of those things are the reason why he was born blind, but he was born this way so that the glory of God might be revealed in him. Mm -hmm. Um, And for the first time ever, I encountered my own story in the text. And so, I, for me, it encountering that story uh, set me on a trajectory where I no longer saw my wheelchair as a as an obstacle, mm. but rather um, this this expression of the diversity of God. Um, mm. So so and and even that was a, a, a leap of growth for me, because when I first read the text, I understood it as, well, God had to make me disabled in order for God to be glorified, because that's what the text suggests. But if that Mm. were true, then God would be pretty sick and sadistic to be making people disabled in order to get glory, right? So, So then what is this idea of glory? What does that mean? Mm. And for me, the more that I've really tease that out and, 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 and try to articulate what does glory mean for folks who are not embodied in a way that is in the uh, norm for everybody else. It has to be that God's glory shows up in the diversity of the way mm-hmm. our bodies show up. And so in my blackness, God is glorified. In my disability, God is glorified. You know, in, in all of the things that make me different from um, or that make you, you, God is glorified. And, and so, um, yeah, my disability is, is God's glory on display. That's really beautiful. Yeah. I, I have, I've struggled with that text. And so I really appreciate your interpretation that God's glory is revealed in the, in the diversity, you know, took a lot of work to get there. (laughs) Yeah. No kidding. Wow. So is there like an element of disability theology or a category within disability theology that you are particularly passionate about? Um, I love to talk about the intersections of blackness Mm. and disability. Uh, 
and blackness, disability, and theology all together. Yeah. Um, so uh, when I did my demon work, um, and and for those who maybe that wasn't clear, it's a demon. Not I wasn't doing demon. Work. A demon. Um, <laughs> I didn't even think um, about that. That's hilarious. Um, yeah, because that word's so normal to me. Yeah. Yeah. So when I was when I was working on my doctor of ministry degree, when you were we working go. on your demons. Uh, yeah. <laughs> there we go. Um, I actually talked about the the um the double disability of blackness and disability okay um um and and this came out my 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 having to name that this was a thing for me actually came out of a very painful moment hmm. um i was i was involved in a uh c p e residency um, for those who are not familiar with that jargon, um, CPE is clinical pastoral education. It's a, um, a, uh, a learning experience that, that ministers go through in order to hone our, uh, pastoral skills. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I, I just so happened to be a resident at a hospital and I went into, went into a, a, a patient's room after, of course, them giving me the okay and all of that great stuff, um, uh, the patient asked me, how do you deal with your two maladies? Um, and I was a bit taken back uh, because, um, I, number one, the person used the word malady, and that was yeah. not, you know, I know what the word means, but it's not, it's not common jargon for us. And so, no. you know, why would why would somebody say malady? Uh, and, and, and so my response was, excuse me, uh, do you, do you mean my disability? And the patient said, no, I'm, I mean, like your two maladies. And I said, well, you know, I, I know that I'm in a wheelchair and they went on to say, and you're black. And, and I was like, Oh, wow. I am okay. yeah. like, <laughs> like, but I, I mean, of course, that's true, but I never, like, nobody had ever framed it for me as a malady, right? Right. And so, um, in the moment, I was, it felt as though the wind had been knocked out of me. Yeah. Um, but that patient saying that to me set me on the course of really having to grapple with the ways that um the ways that we have made blackness a disabling condition in mm -hmm. the world um so so uh for those listening um if you if you google the social model of disability or you just go on youtube and you you look up uh the social model of disability there will be this video that comes up where um, uh, the video explains um, that there's a world created by uh, folks who were born having to use wheelchairs. And so they build everything to their height and to mm. their, you know, their, their, their specifications. And then all of a sudden, uh, people who walk come mm. into that society but the world is not made for them. And so they begin to hit their heads on things. And, 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 and people realize in this community that there's a problem. And so they, they start to uh, create charities and different functions. And, and they even buy helmets for the people who are walking so that when they hit their heads, they're no longer being hurt. Mm -hmm. um, so that the world becomes more adaptive for them. And, and when I, so that, that spells out the social model of disability and, and what I had to really wrestle with after taking that into consideration is what, what ways, um, in what ways has the world been disabling for black folks? Because mm -hmm. it centers on whiteness. It prioritizes whiteness. It, everything rises and falls on whiteness being the norm. And so we have all of these charities and things, you know, uh, uh, different guilds and societies and whatever else 
in order to serve uh, the needs of black folks rather than making us an integral part of society, much like this social model of disability spells out. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and so seeing those parallels, um, I would venture to say that in, in many ways, blackness can be disabling in certain mm-hmm. spaces. Um, and, and, and I think that this is another reason why preaching on disability and talking about disability in the church is so important because as one of my friends put it, justice work is always intersectional. Mm. And so if we are pursuing liberation for disabled folks, we're, we're, that's working to liberate queer folks. And if mm. we're working to liberate queer folks and, and black folks and other folks of color, we're working to liberate folks with disabilities. Um, all of that works hand in hand because in disability <clears throat> is one of those things that intersects so many communities. And so one can be black, queer, and disabled. And, mm-hmm. and so to work for uh, liberation for one should be to work for liberation for all. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so, so why do you think that when we're talking about disability and we're talking about theology and we're linking the two together, why do you think that that could be considered like a bad topic? Like, why are we talking about this on a show like called to be bad? So I, I think that talking about the intersection of disability and theology specifically as it relates to the church, the reason why it is a quote unquote bad or a taboo thing is because it places Um, it places us face to face with the frailty of Mm. humanity. Um, I love to tell people that the truth of the matter, if we are, if we are fortunate to live long enough, disability will be the one thing that touches every one of us in some way, shape or form. Mm. Um, and so, uh, it is something that we don't often talk about in the church because, we don't. We love to believe that we are invincible, mm-hmm. um, and this is the reason why th- this is going to. This may surprise some folks, but if you Google the word pastor, I guarantee you, you will never see someone with a visible disability. Mm-hmm. And the reason why is because we want pastors who have body types. Um, that, that give us something to look up to or mm-hmm. to, to live into. And so if, if, if my pastor has a physical disability, then that means that I have to turn more inwardly and deal with my own. Now, mind you, I'm going to use the word broken, um, my own brokenness, not in the way that says uh, I need to be fixed or that I am in some way um, deficient but um, seeing someone with a disability week in and week out as our spiritual leader, now I have to wrestle with the fact that I don't have it all together. Mm-hmm. And so um, I think that that is primarily the reason why we don't talk about disability. Because in, in some way, shape, or form, we are acknowledging that Folks with disabilities live a very different life than those who are non-disabled. And so But we don't want to acknowledge how the way we've built society is absolutely. what is making that harder. Absolutely. Yes. And so the reason why we don't touch it in church is because um it's much like the don't ask, don't tell policy. Mm. If we pretend it doesn't exist, then we don't have to worry about it bothering us. Yeah, we don't have to take responsibility. Absolutely, until it until it meets us at our doorstep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and then there's the truth that if we talked about disability more, we would have to name that the Bible is probably one of the most ableist texts that ever existed on the face of the planet. Oh, <laughs> go there, do it, yeah, tell us. Mm. I happen to think that everything rises and falls on theology. Mm. 
Um, and 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 I'm probably gonna catch flight for this, but that's okay because I'm on the right podcast for it, right? Oh yeah. Um, oh yeah. Um, I would say that much of the ableism that we encounter in the world is the fault of the church, because if the church, if the church learned to center not disability as the only thing, but if we were a part of the conversation when 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 theologies were being developed and formed and we were not reduced to just metaphor, I think that the world would would encounter folks with disabilities in a very different way. Mm. But because the text that we get most of our theologies from is rife with ableism and our interpretation is as ableist as it is, the mm. church only perpetuates that ableism. I mean, so let's look at Let's look at almost every healing narrative in scripture, yeah. right? Almost every interaction where a healing takes place, there's very rarely the question of, is this something you want? The healing happens because the person offering the healing sees the healing as the reason or the thing that needs to be done so that the disabled person is made right or whole. Mm -hmm. And for those of you who may not be able to see me, you're just hearing my voice, right or whole is in quotes because we, we, you know, we, right or whole is a subjective thing that it, it, <laughs> it's in the eye of the beholder. Right. Um, and so, so I, you know, I recently preached the sermon on, uh, I think it was Acts chapter three, if I'm not mistaken, where Peter and John uh, encountered this man at the gate called beautiful mm. and and anybody who has been in sunday school for a short amount of time may have encountered this story where you know peter and john meet this man and and uh peter makes this presumptuous statement because he says silver and gold have i none but such as i have i give to you uh um and then he tells him to rise and to walk or uh yeah so he speaks healing over him, but he never asked the man if healing was actually what he wanted. Mm -hmm. He just presumes that because I don't have silver and gold, I'm going to go ahead and give you a healing. And yeah. then people celebrate this healing afterwards. And so, I, you know, I don't want to minimize that there's something transformative that happens, but they're celebrating this healing and they've minimized now uh, his whole experience to this act of healing. Nobody ever gets to know his story. We don't know the man's name. We don't know anything except that he has now become an object of, of brokenness needing to be fixed. Um, and so that, that to me is extremely problematic um, yeah. and very ableist. Uh, Amos Young, uh, who is a scholar uh, within the realm of disability theology uh, talks about uh, the book of Acts and that particular interaction and, and says that the problem with that particular text is that it, it, it leans into um, this idea that abledness or able-bodiedness is, is what is the norm. And so anybody who doesn't operate in this norm um, is seen as deficient or wrong mm. um, and 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 this is the same point of view that we preach from when we talk about people with disabilities. We reduce uh, the experience of disability to to being uh, metaphors, mm. and so we talk about God bringing us out of blindness and uh, uh, how a lack of faith can be paralyzing, and mm -hmm. all of these different things, and so we reduce a very real lived experience of people in the biblical era who were very, very disabled, like in a real way to being uh, uh, a picture of what it means to be spiritually blind or spiritually mm -hmm. paralyzed or whatever the case may be. And those things, those things are problematic because it, it removes the, the level of, of realness or nuance from the people's lives that really mm -hmm. like were there in the biblical era. 
if we reduce every interaction of someone with a disability to metaphor, how then do we connect with those people who are disabled in our communities of faith? Right. Because right. the truth is, people with disabilities are the largest uh, minority group in mm. the world. Mm. And, and, and if pastors were more attentive to this reality, we would be mindful of the fact that um, you probably have more folks in your congregation who are disabled than you realize. And so mm. when we reduce those people to just being metaphors in the biblical narrative or any other narrative that we're using, what does that say about their lived experience when we get up to preach? We are centering the experience and the voices of those who are who are non-disabled. And, mm -hmm. and so in doing that, we are further marginalizing people with disabilities in a space where they should be fully welcome to be who they are. Yeah, yeah. So I'm thinking more about like Jesus healing, um, the, the healing stories. And mm -hmm. like I was learning about leprosy in, during biblical times and how leprosy was an overarching term for any skin ailment. Mm -hmm. So it could have mm -hmm. been eczema. It could have been yep. acne, you know, like not necessarily like a highly contagious or a deadly condition, um, but it was viewed as as contagious. I'm wondering if the real issue is not the leprosy necessarily or, you know, insert said disability, mm -hmm. but rather the fact that they were marginalized and separated yeah, from yeah. society. I mean, the thing that I preach uh, whenever I'm talking about healing or actually my, my, my core belief about the ministry of Jesus and the reason that he heals is not because people need to be fixed. Mm. He heals people simply because it is their lack of healing that that removes them from community. Mm -hmm. So so Jesus heals in order for people to be restored to community. Mm -hmm. yeah. We, yeah, we see that we see that in his interaction with the ten lepers when mm -hmm. uh, when he encounters them and 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 then he says, "Go show yourselves to the priest." And there's this whole question of, you know, why didn't the other ones return to say thank you? Um, and this one did. I preached this and it raised a few eyebrows when I said this in my sermon. But I said, Jesus got this wrong mm -hmm. because he, he, he does something with the leper that comes back that I find extremely problematic. Mm -hmm. He says to him, uh, uh, um, you. You came back of all people, the Samaritan, like mm, the, kind of further huh, marginalized you're, you're, or pointing you're out othering him in a way that. Mm. And so we use this as an example to say, oh, it's OK to other certain people. But mm. what I love about this text, even though I, I wrestle with the way that Jesus interacted with that particular leper, is that he tells them, go and show yourselves to the priest and, and that. The text tells us that on their way, they were healed. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so what 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 does it mean for Jesus to send us on our way back into the same place that we've been pushed out of, ostracized from, um, uh, for all intents and purposes, they were segregated onto yeah. their own like colony um, because they were seen as, you know, these contagious, uh, untouchable mm -hmm. um so much so that people didn't even speak to them. So it was right. taboo for him to even be in conversation with them. And, mm -hmm. and yet Jesus doesn't touch them. He doesn't tell them that they're healed. He just says, go and show yourselves to the priest. And the writer says that on their way, they were healed. So what, what that tells me is as they're going, they're encountering community. And mm -hmm. as they're going, community is what is healing them. Oh. They're being around people. They're experiencing yeah. interaction with people. They're being touched and 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 being recognized for who they are. That's what's bringing the healing to them. It's not that Ooh, Jesus that. speaks a word. Um, yeah. It's not that he can't. But in this mm -hmm. instance, he's really pointing to the 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 notion that it it is community that brings about healing. Mm -hmm. That isolation is what what brings about this leprosy. 
and leprosy goes away when they are sent back into the community. Yeah. So do you have a vision for what church could look like um, if we actually took that call and, and, and lived it out? If we actually were a, a model for how to live in difference and, and live out God's diversity in each in each body. I think I think that if we were to see that lived out in the church, we would definitely see more people with disabilities in leadership roles in the church. Mm. Um we would make our ordination processes not as ableist either. <laughs> like Ooh, uh, say more about that. So the whole psyche vow thing that pastors have to go through. Oh. I, I, I understand the reason why we have to go through them because we want to make sure that folks can, you know, hold in tension mm. the anxieties and all of the things that come with being a spiritual leader, right? But we should not be using them as a barometer to determine whether or not someone is neurotypical enough. Mm-hmm to meet the standard to be a pastor. I, I, I love this. This came from a, uh, a mentor of mine years ago who said, God only anoints the authentic self. Mm. And I don't think enough people in the church have heard that truth. Mm. We, we have created a standard wherein, especially pastors, are expected to leave, leave themselves outside of the church in mm. service of the institution. Yeah. And so uh, I, I I can talk about myself. Um, what, is, what does it look like for me to be tired as hell, overworked as hell, mm. like having sat in a wheelchair for almost 12 hours out of the day, my back is burning, my legs are aching, everything hurts. But I have to pretend as though my disability doesn't make a difference in order to mm. be seen as productive. Because I'm already starting behind the eight ball with the physical disability. And so now mm. I have to push through this pain and act like none of that's happening in order to be seen as valuable. Mm. Because we haven't normalized people with disabilities showing up in ways and needing things that we are not used to needing or or, or uh, taking up space in the way that we are used to taking up space as folks who don't have disabilities. And so when somebody comes and they say, you know, we need this accommodation, uh, we hear things like, well, if I do this for you, then I have to do it for everybody. Then why not? Right. right. Yeah. Okay. Then let's do it. Yeah. That's what it means to be just and equitable. And that's what yeah. I think a church that reflects uh, the... The, the beauty of, of divinity would look like us mm -hmm. being able to say, I don't see this as a hardship to create space for you to be mm -hmm. uh, in the fullness of who you are in this space. How can we help you celebrate your diversity? How can we put that on display so that folks, mm -hmm. so that we are not, uh, and I want to be clear, what I'm not suggesting is tokenism. What I'm saying is, how do we put that on display so that people see it and say, now I feel more liberated to be my true self? Yeah, I appreciate that. Like if you had everyone in the world in front of you and you could help them all understand something about disability theology, like what would you tell them? I would say um, a theology, a theology that does not include disability is an incomplete theology. And I want to expand that beyond disability. If your theology does not take into consideration the many and diverse ways that God shows up in humanity, in, in queerness, in blackness, in, in disability, in, in, in femininity, in children and in animals and creation, uh, if, if your theology does not make space for those things, you are dealing with an incomplete theology. Yep. I have goosebumps. <laughs> ah. <laughs> this, is, this is when my job is hard because I feel like there's, I, I, I need to 
say something in response, but I don't know what to say because it's just cause, like, just yes, yes, yes. Uh, what would you say if someone said that you were a bad pastor, reverend, for caring about uh, the intersections between disability and, and race and mm, like, well, my yeah, honest they... response to them would be fuck off, but uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I... <laughs> I, think, I think that the, the truth is the more, the more I've learned to live and be comfortable with my disability, my existence is a big fuck off to so many people. Um, yes. So to live, to live in the way that I am embodied and find mm. joy in it and 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 be content with it um mm-hmm. is is that is to be uh in a in a consistent place of of subversiveness to a, to mm-hmm. a culture that says you should um hide away uh um the world is not made for you and you need to be okay with that mm. uh, like uh, the church is not made for you, and you need to be okay with that. Um, uh, how many how many of our churches are, uh, especially ones that were built before the ADA became, you know, a, a, a thing, um, and many of them have used that this being grandfathered in as a means mm-hmm. to say, oh, well, we don't, you know, our we are we are historic historic building, and so we don't have to make ourselves accessible. Well. What are you saying to the people who have sown into your churches for for years and will soon need an elevator or a ramp or mm-hmm. or something to get in and, and 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 now they are relegated to virtual church because you have made the decision not to make yourselves accessible. Yeah. You're some literally churches saying haven't even building, done that virtually. Right. So, and you're literally saying the building is more important than the absolutely. people who meet. Yeah. So our inclusion of folks with disabilities has to be more than just putting ramps and elevators in the building. Mm. And 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 this is a this is a consistent refrain of mine. Simply because you welcome us into the building does not mean you want us there. Mm. So right. I can be in your building and a part of your service and still not be a valued contributor to what's happening. Mm-hmm in the life of the faith community. I don't I don't believe that people with disabilities are valued until our stories matter to mm-hmm. the congregation. Uh, our voices in the conversations happening, um, our voices have to be welcomed into those conversations. Don't talk about us without us. Don't yeah. don't make decisions about us without us at the table. Um, these are all things that I think the church has to has to name the ways that they have screwed up or we have screwed up as an institution uh, creating space for people with disabilities mm-hmm. we've 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 relegated folks with disabilities to um i would say beyond the margins of society and and we are finally coming around to to realizing that and maybe it's because covid was a a a mass disabling event mm. that, you know now we're like oh wow yeah disability is a thing we, we got to do a better job um yeah. and and part of part of the way that i do that to get back to the original question is to to adopt this ethic or mood of fuck offness um <laughs> Uh, because I, you know, I'm simply going to be me. What I'm hoping that people leave this time together uh, with is is the notion that we all are made in different ways, shapes, and forms, and some of those ways have yet to reveal themselves. Some of those ways are going to meet us as we travel down the road, mm. um, but it but it does not it does not make us any less effective. Or any less, any less of a glory carrier. Jesus makes it clear that the man was born blind so that the glory of God might be revealed in him. He revealed God's glory in his blindness, and he revealed God's glory in his healedness. Um, mm-hmm. and, and, and I hope that people leave this conversation knowing that 
in whatever form they show up in, they are revealing God's glory. And I hope that that, that truth brings peace. You stole my blessing. That was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> you can still offer us a blessing. Yeah, I, I will. But yeah, thank you for that. That was a really, that was a lovely, like, full circle moment of coming back to the healing of the 10 people with leprosy. And um, JJ and all you beautiful baddies, may you go from this episode knowing that um, you, as you are, you carry the glory of God within you. Um, you are beautifully and wonderfully made, and um, and you are loved. And may you pour out that love on others. Amen. Thank you.